Hello, I'm Malcolm Dome. Delighted to say I'm here with Ken Hensley today, musician par excellence, and we're going to be talking about his second solo album, Eager to Please, getting into real detail. When was the decision made for you to do an, another album? Uh, it was a confusing period. I mean, there, there was a little bit of turmoil in the band situation mm. at the time and there was certainly quite a lot of turmoil in my own personal life um but we had a break in the action and um i went to jerry and said you know i'd like to do another solo album uh this time my motivation was just a little different and uh although i didn't make that publicly known i mean i was really starting to look for alternatives to the band right did you have most of these songs already written? No, I had probably half of them already written. Right. Um, I rented a house in Los Angeles and went out there for a number of months and finished uh, a few more. But I must say that I went into the studio in LA with this originally not as well prepared, I think, as I should have been, to be perfectly honest with you. I think I'm right in saying Longer Shadows actually harks back to the time when you were working with Simon Kirk and Paul Kozloff on demos. Mm -hmm. And isn't Paul Kozloff on this one track, the demo version that is? On the demo version, mm. yeah, but not on the... Uh, on the no, not, not on the, the fin yeah. finished version. Yeah. When you say you weren't as well prepared, was that because everything was rushed? No, it wasn't. It, it was more a matter of the, the fact that um, th there was this term or a little bit of confusion mm. within the band and, and some little ego problems that were going on and and so on and um you know i mean success had taken hold of us mm. uh, on a grand scale and uh the the excess that came with the success was uh, had also taken hold of all of us but in different ways yeah so i think there was less of an innocence about it that, that it was about proud words had an innocence and an honesty about it that that I couldn't carry at the time into into eager to please. You, it, you, it, it was like a, a toxic thing. It, it, it kind of in, infected the project. Right. Did you have a real time scale you were working to in LA? No, not really. Um, I can't. You know, I, I, I went to LA. I was thinking of actually moving there permanently, mm. but I quickly found out that I couldn't exist in in that environment at that time. Um, but certainly the time scale that I had in mind was affected by the fact that people there didn't work on my time scale. Right. I mean, I'm an early morning person. I get up, I go to work, I do my thing. These people don't crawl out of bed until two or three o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> and so it, it really was difficult logistically to put everything together and make it happen and build some momentum. Peter Gallum uh, produced eager to please, didn't he? Yep. He'd worked on Proud Words. Mm -hmm. So what made him the guy you wanted to work with this time? Was it because you knew him? Well, it was logistically impossible for Jerry to be out there right. in LA. Um, we did most of the work at Crystal Sound, mm. and a great studio where you know people like Stevie Wonder had recorded and Phil Spector was a, a producer there. Um, so in the absence of Jerry, and with me not being fully confident in my own ability to, yeah. to produce at that point, uh, Peter was a good substitute. Did you do a lot of preparation before going into the studio? Not to say pre-production, but rehearsing? Not really, no. Most of the preparation was done in, in the studio itself, which was um, created a, a lot of problems of its own. Expensive way to do it, I would have thought. Oh, a ridiculous way to do it. <laughs> I, I can honestly say overall, if I had to redo Eager to Please and take this batch of songs and re-record them, I would do it totally differently. Mm. I certainly wouldn't do it in LA. Um, I don't know, can't say where I would do it, but I definitely wouldn't do it in LA. This environment was not right for me. Too many distractions in LA? No, it, for me it wasn't the distractions. I mean, I was able to focus on my work very easily. Mm. But it was just getting all the the peripheral individuals that, that were, should have been involved, getting them to uh, do what they were supposed to do when they were supposed to do it. <laughs> and it, it was practically impossible. I mean, Bugs Pemberton, um, mm. he played with Screaming Lord Such. Yes, I don't yeah. know if you, you know the history of that. Yeah. He had successfully moved to LA and settled down and totally at home there. 
but he still had enough of the UK in him where I could get him motivated. And Mark Clark w was similar. Yeah. But we needed the other people. We needed the equipment guys. We needed the engineers. We needed everybody to to be on the ball and to be enthusiastic and, and so on. And that's just not the way LA people worked in those days. Was Pugs Pemberton an old friend of yours? No. So how did you hook up with him? Well, Mark Clark introduced me to him. Ah, right. They were, uh, they were partners in crime, uh, came from the same part of the world, Liverpool. And um, uh, I met Bugs and we got on extremely well. And he was a great guy, made great sandwiches. <laughs> and um, he wasn't a great drummer. Hmm. Um, I don't think Screaming Lord Such would have bred, bred great musicians. But he was okay and he was good and he, his enthusiasm kind of made up for his lack of right. skill a little bit. But n nevertheless, it was a small compromise. Mark Clark obviously in you anyway. Yeah, yeah. Mark I've always gotten along with and still do extremely well. I have a lot of respect for Mark. He got, he got some pretty raw treatment from, from the band uh, at the time he, he, he sort of stepped in. But Mark, I've always loved working with, and he's a really good writer, and he helped me fill in some blanks mm. on, on the album. In fact, he co-wrote one song called Stargazer, yes. which I do believe was totally outside of you. Yeah, it was not my type of song at all, but um, he, he, did, he did the same with some other things. I mean, he took them somewhere else. Mm. Uh, and he's the only other bass player besides John Wetton, who I know who was capable of doing that, without losing the character of the song. So, you know, I, I had a good team. Yeah. It's just that, that all the parts were not in Peripheral. place. Peripheral, yeah. Did you give Mark Clark and Bugs Pemberton free reign to some extent, do what you feel works? Um, to some extent, yeah. Not, not to a large extent, because I was still a control freak that I'd always <laughs> been. In. So I, I, I wouldn't give him too much freedom. What was the difference between Peter Gallen and Jerry Brown as producers? Jerry was uh, more of a dominating type of producer. Mm. When Jerry said something, he did it. Uh, Peter was less intimidating and more passive. So, uh, but, but I could work with Peter very easily, almost as a co-producer. Mm. Whereas with Jerry, I just did what Jerry told me to do. And if Jerry said something sounded good, then you just had to accept it, whether you agreed with it or not. Um, <clears throat> with Peter, Peter was a little more flexible and uh, that would have made a difference too because if Jerry had been there, he would have said, stop, let's go back to England and start the album again. Right. Were you constantly in touch with Jerry, updating yeah. what's going on? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I was in, in touch and, you know, of course, the band was so huge at the time mm. that Jerry was so wrapped up with, with all of that and he was beginning to spread his wings as a, an entrepreneur and build his business. So... Um, you know, we were in touch. I kept in touch with him and kept him informed on how things were going. Right. Um, and eventually we did ship the whole project back to Europe and finish it in London. So. How long did you spend in LA in the studio then? Uh, I, ha I rented a house there in West Hollywood and I lived there in that house for six months on and off. Mm. Um, in the studio, I probably wasn't in the studio more than three to four weeks. Were you in there every day? particular hours or? yeah um, yeah whenever I could get the troops in line yeah we were we were there every day I mean I was used to working you know as much as we needed to work yeah I mean there was never a time limit and I was used to working every single day it didn't matter to me that's what I did but in LA it was totally different I couldn't control the circumstances in which the album was being made was there ever a point when you were in that studio in LA when you thought, I've got to actually get back to England and do this in a situation where I know I can control I it? I was reluctant to give up. I knew it wasn't going well, but mm. I was reluctant to give up. But in the end, um, I think we'd finished tracking all that we could track. Mm. And uh, Peter and I both agreed that we needed to finish the record back in London. Did you, were you tempted at all to bring in any of the musicians hanging around in LA to guest on the record, or did you very much want to keep it under your hat? I didn't really know any of the musicians around uh, at the time. In the, in the early part and pre-mid-70s, the LA scene was dominated by 
um, Jackson Brown, Buddy mm. Eagles, and people, Linda Ronstadt, and people like yeah. that. They're not exactly the kind of people to come in and make a rock album. <laughs> and say, hey, Linda, you want to come and sing one of my rock songs? <laughs> So um, Jackson, who I, I got to know later in life quite well, mm. I had a lot of respect for him. Um, you know, no, that, that whole LA scene was very different then. There was no um, GIT. There was no, yeah. um, you know, breeding ground for you know, glam rock or anything like that. It was a very different scene. Some of the songs are interesting. I mean, for instance, part three. Only some well, of them, Malcolm. Uh, well, <laughs> some, some all, all interesting. Some are more interesting than others. Let's put ah, it that way. Very good. Uh, so well you, wriggled. You, you've got <laughs> exactly part three. Were there parts one and two? No, there weren't. And I don't even know why I called it that. To tell you the truth, it's, it's all part of the confusion of the time. I mean, it was really unsettled. The whole thing which never really, really got on the ground. It was. Uh, there were none of those magic moments, you mm. know. It was, it was just uh, going through a process which I knew wasn't perfect and wasn't ideal, but I had to go through it. Right. I had to finish it for two reasons: one, because we'd invested in it, and two, because I was determined to prove that every record in LA was the right decision, even oh, though I course, knew yeah. it was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and through the eyes of a child, you mentioned earlier the loss of innocence. Was that a, a song which reflected that loss of innocence? No. Absolutely not. It, it was. Uh, it was. This was. This for me it was the best song on the record. Mm. Um, others might disagree with that, but I. I think it was, and it's a song I still play. That's um, a, it's a very strong song. I just wonder because he said that the innocence and ch childlike and so. Yeah, that. but to me, that <clears throat> lyrically, it's it's quite a strong song, and I really feel like it makes sense. Mm. And this song made sense in an environment where nothing made sense. Uh, everything around me made no sense at all, but this song kind of penetrated that and, and made sense, and I felt good about it. Right. And if I feel good about a song, then I'm happy. If I don't, I'm not happy. <laughs> so what was the song about then? It wasn't. It was, a, it was an imaginary thing. Right. It, so. was, it was about how when we're young and innocent, we see things a certain way and we learn how wonderful things are going to be, and then we grow up and find out it's all a lie. Mm. Uh, that applied to my thinking then and it applies in real life now I mean you have to we're never really fully prepared for what life brings and uh, you know I've recently had a stark reminder of that and um, so you know it, it, it was just the, the reflection on the innocence of, of childhood and and how it yeah. um, develops or doesn't in adulthood when you got the tapes back to England to finish it off and listen back, were you ever tempted to think, can we re-record some of this? Um, yeah, but I was never given the opportunity to. Right. It, you know, there was a budget and I had, I had already blown most of it. And, uh, <laughs> that's, that's happened in those It wasn't sessions. a lot of money either, but I'd already blown most of it. And I, I really felt like if I tried to start again, mm. uh, then I'd be in big trouble in terms of time and in terms of money. And not only that, the band was getting busy again mm. and there was all kinds of things going on within the band. So I didn't have that opportunity. Did you get the feeling the band were supportive of you doing another solo album? I don't think the band cared, actually, to be honest with you. I mean, they knew I was going to do it anyway, mm. whether they were supportive or not. But the thing was that what, ended up, what I ended up with, Malcolm, was a compromise. And I don't do compromise it mm. very well at all. But that's the nature of a band is a compromise, really. Well, it's the nature of a musical career. Yeah. I mean, you yeah. know, sometimes you lose direction uh, and it takes a while to get that direction back. And I definitely had lost direction completely by then. <coughs> Why did you choose to call it Eager to Please? Because I was. Hmm. I, I really wanted to, to make a record that was going to make people happy and be successful. And that's how I felt. So I used that as a title. And you had a painting on the cover rather than a photo. Right. And I was very happy with the painting and very privileged to sit for Sir Alfred Hayworth. Mm. Uh, he wasn't a sir at the time. He became a sir yeah. afterwards, largely, Obviously as, a working with you, largely no as a result of drawing my album cover. Yes, absolutely. People have been <laughs> knighted for less. <laughs> That's very true. But uh, sitting for him wasn't easy because, you know, you have to sit still for five hours and I wasn't into that either. I'm still <laughs> not. Um, but for very different reasons. And um, 
I thought I thought the cover was kind of nice. I thought it was kind of cool. I do not know why they faked my autograph at the bottom of the the mm. the cover. Yeah. The 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 sort of signature at the bottom right hand corner is not mine. Really? Uh, I don't know why they did that. <laughs> and we'll never find out. Yeah. Maybe it's because painting uh, painter's signature on there will put the artist's signature as an image. I don't know if he did it actually to tell you the truth, but it's definitely not my writing <laughs> or my signature. How did you feel when the album was released? Did you feel like, oh, you know what, I'm happy it's out, but I'm not happy? Yes, that's pretty much exactly how I felt. Um, I felt like the job was done, uh, but I never got rid of the feeling that the, there was so much compromise in it. Mm. In, in various, not ov overall it was a compromise, but there were specific areas of it which I knew were not right, which I knew I could have done so much better, and that's not a good feeling. No, I'm sure, I'm sure it isn't. No. Were there any thoughts given to doing any live shows for that hour? I know, obviously, in Proud Words, you didn't have the time. Was there any time no. at all to think about that? No, I mean, you know, people used to talk to me about doing things like that. They were usually sideline friends that, you know, would come to me and say, you know, well, what you're doing now is so much better than what the band's doing, and, you know, you should really think about going out on your own. And um, I didn't think that was right thinking. Hmm. And I found out much later on that... I was right. It wasn't right thinking. It wasn't a good idea. So was an album out there that you weren't totally happy with? In your mind, were you thinking, I've got to do another album soon because I want to get this out of my system? No, I was so busy with the band at that point that it, it, if I needed compensation or consolation, it would have come from the, the work I was doing with the band at the time. Were any of the songs from Eager to Please songs that you'd originally written with the possibility of doing them as a heap song? No, I don't think so. No, I don't think there was anything in there that I had ever even presented to the band, to tell you the truth. Uh, they were all just songs in my book and um, I wanted to find a home for them. But they weren't finished, they weren't polished, they weren't mm. completely ready. I just fooled myself into thinking that they were and uh, that shows in the end result, actually. Obviously, you're not going to claim you're proud or happy with the album, but do you feel you have to go through the process of doing this album to come out the other side? I don't know. I don't know. I, like I said, I think, you know, if you are committed to your career hmm. as a musician, you're going to have to accept, in the same way probably sportsmen and things do, that there's going to be ups and downs. Um, I felt the downs around that time of my career and around that album were self-inflicted. Hmm. I don't think there was any real, and I couldn't blame anybody or anything for it. It was just, I didn't prepare properly, I didn't execute properly, and so the end result was a compromise. And it was my fault, but I felt like I, I, I knew that I could work my way through that and learn from it, and I did. Given a choice, would you love to go back now and re-record some of those songs, knowing what you do now? I'd like to go back and re-record the whole bloody album, actually. 